Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this press conference from the 47th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Uh, thank you for being here in the room. Welcome to our live audience on camera, and of course, uh, a warm welcome to our panel here today. Uh, this press conference is dedicated to the question um, of the future of humanitarian payments. What is the future of humanitarian, humanitarian payments uh, looks like, and we have a wonderful panel here today that has uh, uh, interesting things to say from, from various angles, as you can imagine. Um, and while you all might know who's joining me on the panel, I'll, I'll still um, introduce them to you for the sake especially of our online audience as well. To my immediate left, we're joined by Stephen O'Brien. He's the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator of the United Nations <coughs> Office for the Co Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. The short version is OCHA. Much better. Yes. Um, right at the center of our panel here today, uh, we're uh, pleased to be joined by Arthur and Cousin. She's the Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program in Rome. And last but not least, we're joined by Mats Granried. He's the Director General of GSMA, uh, representing the mobile phone companies of this world. Humanitarian payments. Without further ado, Stephen, I'd like to invite you to share with us uh, your view on why this is an important issue and what we can gain from this uh, technological solution, please. Well, thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, with my fellow panelists, we're delighted to be here to uh, be with you in uh, uh, putting forward the very important uh, principles on public-private cooperation in humanitarian payments uh, as a result of uh, working with the World Economic Forum. So um, uh, we're very glad to have this chance to mark the launch of, uh, of the World Economic Forum's principles on public-private cooperation in humanitarian payments, meeting growing humanitarian need around the world and reaching those worst affected by conflict and natural disasters with rapid, effective assistance to save lives and safeguard dignity is one of the greatest and most all-consuming challenges we face so large that no one of us can do it alone and we have to harness uh, all the partnerships uh, and collaboration uh, possible. So rising to this challenge means harnessing uh, that collective expertise using all available technologies and approaches and building on lessons learned from across different fields and industries. Together we must be relentlessly innovative, building on what works and demanding the highest level of response for those most impacted by crisis. For humanitarians, this means reaching out to private sector actors to build strategic partnerships and learning from their great wealth of experience. So I would like to thank the World Economic Forum for their leadership in drafting these principles on public-private cooperation in humanitarian payments. They will enable us to harness the best private sector expertise and the latest technological advances to better serve affected people. They build on existing initiatives to put in place a strong framework for collective action on cash-based assistance. <coughs> the specialized agencies, uh, notably the World Food Program, uh, led by Arthur and Cousin on my left, and UNICEF and UNHCR mm. uh, in particular, have led the way in our overall coordinated approach. And over the past year, through the World Humanitarian Summit and the Grand Bargain, humanitarian actors committed to deliver more humanitarian assistance in the form of cash systematically considering cash-based assistance alongside more traditional response modalities and adapting our systems to enable the use of cash wherever appropriate. The United Nations Secretary General's Agenda for Humanity recommends that, and I quote, where markets and operational contexts permit, cash-based programming should be the preferred and default method of support. There is an overwhelming evidence for the effectiveness of cash-based assistance when used in the right contexts. In Ethiopia, cash-based assistance was found in one study to be up to 30% more efficient than traditional food aid. In Lebanon, an IRC study found that 80% of affected people preferred cash-based assistance. And in Somalia, two and a half times more aid reached beneficiaries through cash versus food. As cash transfers become an increasingly significant component of humanitarian response, we need to work with those who are experienced in delivering funds rapidly in challenging contexts in a way which empowers and protects the recipient. Digital payments 
have the potential to deliver a wide range of benefits, including speeding and scaling up implementation, increasing transparency, improving program cost effectiveness, and reducing the potential for fraud and security incidents. They can also link program participants to a range of financial services, as well as to longer-term national-led social safety net systems. Humanitarian need has never been greater, and as needs grow rapidly, the resources we have to address them cannot keep up. In 2017, the humanitarian system seeks $22.2 billion to reach more than 93 million people with life-saving assistance. And last year, we received just over half of the resources needed to meet these basic survival needs. So it is clear that continuing with business as usual will not work, and that innovation and alternative options are critically required. Making progress on this front demands that humanitarian and private sector speak out a common language. These principles seek, a, seek to create that common language by laying out a shared set of guidelines, jointly elaborated by humanitarian and private sector actors, to facilitate strategic dialogue, partnership opportunities, and joint ways of working. And they also make clear that private sector actors are not just service providers. Rather, they can offer technical expertise, knowledge, and experience to help us figure out where people in need are, how best to reach them, and how to address their most pressing needs. Coordination and dialogue between humanitarian actors and private sector payments providers must be more systematic, must begin earlier, and result in real improvements for those affected by crisis. And the humanitarian principles of humanity neutrality, impartiality and independence, and the needs of all affected people, wherever they are, whoever they are, however their need arose, and whatever their survival and protection needs, they should all uh, guide uh, all, every single one of our joint endeavors. So these principles on public-private cooperation will help guide both humanitarian and private sector actors as we scale up principled, effective, and innovative partnerships for humanitarian payments. So I now call upon the humanitarian community and the private sector to put these principles into action when implementing digital payments programs so that together our efforts can have the greatest impact on those most in need. And more important than that, now we have to hear what it really sounds like from the ground and for people affected by yeah. crisis. Thank you, Stephen. Ertherin, um, when we see pictures uh, in, on television, uh, on, uh, in newspapers about the work that your organization does, um, one sees food distribution, right? That's the traditional way how it's depicted. So um, how's this payment, humanitarian payment, the digital payment version, how's that relevant for your work? Um, explain to us why, uh, uh, why you're involved. Well, thank you very much for that question because and you're absolutely right. When crisis strikes, when conflict occurs, and there is no f and there is no food available, WFP provides food, and we will continue to do that because you can't eat a mobile transfer. But when markets come online and food is available, we provide the cash assistance that will allow those who have been affected by the crisis, who do not have the financial resources to afford that available food, we make that food accessible to them by providing mobile transfers. But what's really exciting about this is it also becomes an opportunity for us to build what becomes a database of information of those who are the most vulnerable in a country. And I'll give you an example. Right now, we're working with the Kenyan government to take the database that WFP has and transfer that over to the Kenyan government so that they can use that as the basis for their social protection program and ultimately provide the financial benefits to through the government to that same population to support their food security needs for the longer term. And so we need to ensure that as we are building these networks that support mobile transfers of, of, of of uh, <clears throat> money, that that also becomes the basis for supporting the country's financial system as well. Because what we want to build is a country that is stronger, for, on a, has a stronger financial footprint for reaching those who are most vulnerable even after a crisis. So imagine then the next time a crisis occurs in Kenya, we can simply use the government's database to target immediately exactly who's needs allows us to serve faster, more effectively, more efficiently. Thank you, Ertherin. Mats, so from what Ertherin is saying, this sounds, we're not just talking about 
a different way of payment, but we're talking about a systems change in how we get help, uh, uh, humanitarian help to the people who need it most. Um, talk to us a little bit about the role of connectivity and how that can help to make these payments faster and more secure. Yeah, no, so uh, GSMA then is an organization, an umbrella organization for all mobile operators globally, and it's roughly 800 mobile operators on this planet. Um, and the reach that these 800 mobile operators have collectively is quite impressive. Almost 5 billion unique subscribers subscribes to the services from these mobile operators. So uh, mobile operators certainly plays a, an important role in daily life, but also plays a huge important role in times of disasters. Uh, we know from research that we have done that refugees, which is not very difficult to understand, refugees prioritize connectivity sometimes before food, because it is so important to understand where are my relatives, what's happening in the planet, where can I go, wh where should I not go, et cetera. So finding Wi-Fi spots, finding connectivity, finding charging stations is really critical. Uh, and I think the mobile industry, we take this very, very serious, uh, especially at, at this day and age. Uh, we launched um, last year something called the, the Humanitarian Connectivity Charter which is uh, a charter that aligns the industry. We have today 100 mobile operators in 75 different countries that have signed up to this charter. And it's alignment, it is a preparedness, it's sharing best practice. So when disaster strikes, we will be a little bit more prepared. We will know in advance what we should be doing. And of course, mobile payment is, is one part of that as well. Um, we have a, a mobile money initiative in, in many parts of the world, and that is certainly one area what, what can we, what, what, that we can contribute with. If I, um, By all if, means. If I may, when, when we talk about connectivity uh, it, as a baseline, a basis, a base tool that is required for us to transfer through mobile technology, the other requirement is the policy environment, a regulatory environment, an enabling environment that allows those mobile operators to pro provide data to the humanitarian operators to ensure that we can use their access to meet the needs of no those we serve. So it is it is critical that we, in, in partnership with the mobile operators, the humanitarian community is working together to not only de develop the connectivity to the, to the last mile, to ensure we can serve those, but that we're also working with the governments to provide the appropriate regulation, regulation so that the em enabling environment is in place at the time the crisis occurs to allow us to maximize the opportunity that these relationships create. Thank you. So let me put you on the spot there, Arthurin, because okay. we do have 40, 50 heads of state and government here. We have more than 300 ministers here, and maybe S Stephen will chip in and, and, and help you there. Um, what is it um, that the governments need to do most urgently? Most urgently is exactly that. We need to <coughs> have governments that recognize the opportunity that this tool, this connectivity and regulation, regulatory environment together can provide for disaster preparation. Every government is looking to mitigate the impact of disaster. The regula having the appropriate regulatory environment in place is one of those tools that's often forgotten when you think about what is necessary to allow a government to effectively support the needs of their people after a crisis. And I just add that one of the most difficult things that governments uh, find to be able to persuade their own people to invest in with their taxpayers' money is in preparation, in prevention, in advance of the facts of a crisis occurring. And that's where this becomes so important because you heard from Earthrin's very real example how tapping into the regulatory framework, tapping into the technological expertise already proven uh, by the industry mm -hmm. means that so much of the work that you need to have done in order to be most effective to create the biggest impact for people in need in a crisis is in place. It's simply too late to invent it when the crisis hits. Right. Thank you, Stephen. And Mats, you would be the first private sector representative in Davos who doesn't say governments need to move faster and, and, and go <laughs> further. So I see you want to add to that, please. Yeah, governments need to move faster. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was also going to say back to, to Earthrin's comment on, on the governments, but I, I uh, when disaster strikes, it's too late. That's exactly what Stephen said. Uh, big data <coughs> will, of course, play a huge role going forward on collecting 
uh, whereabouts of people, uh, Ebola for instance, if we would have had a better preparedness, we would have avoided a, a bit of that crisis. So I would urge governments and regulatory bodies to make sure that we have policies in place of when disaster strikes, that we can share data cross border sometimes between mobile operators. Sometimes we don't want to share data between different operators. That is our problem. Mm. Uh, but sharing data between one country and another country is very difficult. It is very sensitive. And I think that now is the time to come together and solve that issue mm. before we have a next pandemic. And one line, but preparedness does cost money. But <coughs> preparedness is a down payment on a response and it provides a discount on recovery. And so having governments prioritize preparedness, whether it's through regulation or providing the type of co support for connectivity, will provide an opportunity for them to reduce the cost of actually responding when the, a disaster or crisis occurs. Mm, thank you. Um, so that, that actually uh, b built a good bridge because we asked our audience on social media before for questions. And one question that, that came in was about data protection. And you, you breezed, uh, breezed mm -hmm. on that, uh, Matt, because they say, okay, these are the most vulnerable people. And we're collecting their data and potentially you can locate them in these crisis areas. So what can be done to limit the, the risks associated with that? Well, I, I think that uh, the mobile operator community, we are heavily regulated and, and uh, in, in literally all countries across the globe. Um, I, I feel very comfortable in, uh, in knowing that my data is being sort of saved and stored with my carrier. And I know that that is protected. I would be less comfortable if I would use a so-called over-the-top player, an internet player, uh, where I do not know where that data will be ending up. So I think from, from a mobile operator perspective, I feel very confident that we know where the data is and we are bound by regulations. We're bound by having a continuous customer relationship. So we take these privacy issues extraordinarily serious, extraordinarily serious. And when it comes to uh, the whereabouts of individuals, I think it is the important thing here is to make sure it's an anonymized. So you cannot you just look at the big pictures, not looking at where, where is Mats and where is Steven, et cetera. But it's the big picture that we need to look at. It needs to be anonymized. Mobile operators are heavily regulated, so I feel very comfortable in that. Side. But we take it serious, exactly what you say. These are people that are most vulnerable, uh, and we don't want to come across as naive or anything like that. But we know what's, what, what is at stake here. Mm. Thank you. Um, well, I can I just add that we know from experience that even some people who are moving across borders can sometimes be very nervous about registering because they're worried about where that data will end up. And as 80% of humanitarian need across our planet today is being generated by man-made and protracted crisis of conflict, then you have even more potential for people being nervous about where they could be identified because of perceptions, not necessarily reality, perceptions of uh, being partisan to to some uh, side of a, a conflict or another. Mm -hmm. And so I think the fact that this is already so heavily invested in by the industry and that it is not something which the public realm has been given the donated amounts in order to reinvent that all of its own, we have this partnership where we can tap into what has already been a very strongly regulated position and particularly where you get this anonymization. So we get the benefit of all that data which Earthrin has so uh, rightly uh, said is so powerful in projecting where you can get to meet people's needs, but at the same time without the risk of privacy. And we need to continue to have that debate and to assure people that that's the case, to give them confidence in the way that this is utilized. Mm -hmm. So how many years do I have to wait before I can invite the three of you back to this panel and you answer the question and say, yes, digital humanitarian payments are the norm? Next year. Next year. Well, I can tell you that between 2010 and 2016, we have had a threefold increase in the amount of cash-based transfers at WFP. And we are the largest providers of cash-based transfers in the humanitarian system. And so at, at, if you look at every 18 months, you have exponential change in with technology. I would expect that as within the next 18 months to two, two and a half to three years, that you will see significant changes in how we operate uh, as humanitarians in the disposition of assistance. And I may say that it is WFP, which has been the the lead on this because as the from the coordinator's perspective looking across the piece it's been that huge six-year 
exponential experience, mm -hmm. which has helped accumulate into where we are today. And that's why we're, we're here, because you, you don't get to this confidence of having a charter, having uh, an ability to have this uh, public-private partnership set out in a, in a confident way, unless you're building upon the reality of the experience on the ground, which is what, in particular, WFP, uh, with its reach and its enormous scale, has been able to help lead as we coordinate this as something as a tool uh, for us all, all to be able to have access to. Right, and what makes it great is that what we're seeing is, and Stephen mentioned this in his opening comments, is that across the UN, we are looking at interoperability across our systems. Uh, and in conversation with the international NGOs as well, is how do we share that interoperability with them while protecting the data of those that we serve to ensure that as a community of actors, all of the exponential changes that provide us with the, with the ability to perform more effectively is shared and to the benefit of those who need our services. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from the room? If not, um, yes, the gentleman in the back, there's a microphone. If you could state your name and organization for the sake of our online audience, yeah, please. My, my name is Ken Choi. I'm from I'm a journalist from uh, Chosen Daily Newspaper, Korea. I, I presume that this payment you're talking about is giving uh, aids to these, these uh, refugees or these people with displaced, is that correct? Absolutely. The, this, this payment that, that yes, digital that, that's, payment. Yes, that's one group of recipients of support. Um, we also provide uh, cash-based transfers and to, through mobile technology in, um, in drought situations in Madagascar, for example, okay. where there's no access to food because of El Nino, we're providing a cash-based transfer. So it is becoming more of a tool that we use where there are markets that are working. Um, <clears throat> that allow us to provide the provision of humanitarian assistance through cash, allowing the beneficiary then to, pr to prioritize what foods they want, okay. uh, as opposed to us bringing in food. And, and the question I try to ask is, like, there are a lot of North Korean refugees in China. And, uh, <clears throat> I mean, Chinese market is perfectly functioning. They have all these financial mm -hmm. sy you know, systems and, and phone systems and mobile operators and so on. But m most of these 100,000 North Korean refugees, they use someone else's phone. Uh, you know, they're not, they don't have their own bank account. They don't have you know, any registry. Mm -hmm. They don't have anything at, at all. They are using all these things mm -hmm. off the market. So I'm just wondering how you would be able to reach these people uh, to give the actual benefits of the, these digital payments and so on. So I'm pre I presume that this will be the case with, in many other parts of the world as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ken. So the question is, how do you reach people who don't have... Well, I think, the again, again Earthrin should answer, but they, they, they be absolutely clear, this is where appropriate. It's context-specific, mm -hmm. and that's exactly... Uh, and, and Earthrin makes the point very powerfully, which I'd like to emphasize. Uh, you have to have functioning markets, so where you do, as you've uh, pointed out, then it would be up to Earthrin and all her expert team to make an assessment where the cash is an appropriate response to meet those needs. But Earthrin... <coughs> It, that's an interesting question about the when they don't have uh, their own phones. And what we find ourselves doing, working with the mobile technology community, is we have uh, chips, the phone, that's what they're called, right? Well, SIM cards, yeah. SIM cards, yeah. thank you. Um, I use a BlackBerry, okay? <laughs> but, you okay. See, but you still have a SIM card. I still have a SIM card. And what we do is we distribute the SIM card. And the SIM card has a unique identifier on it that we can record the beneficiary information on to relate it to that SIM card number. And then they can use that SIM card in anyone's phone to access their benefits. Um, without the phone number. It's the, actually the SIM card that we load the data onto, that we load the cash onto, and you can yeah, do the technical part no, here. But, but you're absolutely right. That, that, you know, the, the SIM card has a unique number, but it also linked to the, it's also linked to the phone number itself. So I think the mobile carriers here, we play the enabling role. Uh, we have you know, a, a vast amount of different solutions, and I think what you are describing is a very intelligent way of handing out SIM cards, because then we don't need to know necessarily what your name is. We just need to know your phone number, and that is another way of reaching you.
Right, but that phone, uh, the SIM card, is probably embedded at the phone number of the local mobile operator. Well, it could be any mobile operator. That, that is sort mm -hmm. of the beauty of it. Uh, again, we're just a, an enabler in, in this case, so right? this SIM card, if they have it in China or Korea, it works anywhere? It works anywhere, mm -hmm. yeah. If, if it is on the sort of prevailing technology standard, which is now becoming um, uh, unanimous o over the, the globe. Mm. Thank you very Thank much. You. We have time for one last uh, question, and I'd uh, kindly ask my panelists for short answers as we are okay. already a bit okay. running over time, but uh, please. This is Thomas Seifert from Wiener Zeitung, Vienna, Austria. Uh, this question is for the WFP, because I'm wondering, are governments and donors more reluctant to hand over cash to you that they ultimately distribute than, let's say, wheat or sugar, flour, anything that they might have more easy, more easy access that they were willing to part with more readily than with cash? Well, <coughs> while um, the, the majority of our donors today provide us with cash, and they provide us with cash contributions as opposed to food contributions, we still have um, um, countries that provide uh, in-kind contributions, but the majority of, of uh, the resources that we receive from donor countries is in cash. And then the <clears throat> expectation is that we are going to make the right decision about what is the appropriate modality for the assistance that we provide. And the governments have given us that authority, but what they require from us is that we have the systems in place to protect whatever the intervention is, the cash or the food, that it is not used for inappropriately and that is received by the person who is actually the target uh, for, uh, and person in need of those benefits. <coughs> Quick one, please. Yes, of course. So, uh, because I think uh, what I've seen in Lebanon is that you have mm -hmm. all experienced mm -hmm. a, a beneficial situation for the local economy, yes. right? So it can you elaborate on that maybe? Very much so. Thank you very much for that opportunity. The, you're absolutely right. <coughs> and we have a card in, in Lebanon that um, we load benefits on, not just for WFP, education benefits from UNICEF, the World Bank puts on cash support benefits onto one card. And what it does is it allows the, the refugee who receives that card to purchase what they need from the local market. And they all live in host communities, and the host communities that they live in are also poor communities. And when we talk to store owners and, and uh, storekeepers in those areas, they say, that they are able to increase the number of people that they hire, both at, from for, as refugees as well as local um, <coughs> local hires. Um, that because of the significant financial impact that our contributions have on the local economy. And that makes the, the acceptance of the refugees ever more possible because they are not seen as a burden on the community, but an opportunity for that community. Thank you very much, Arthurin. Thank you to all my panelists here today. Thank you for watching and thank you for being here. Uh, I think it's a very important topic, and we'll report back uh, in uh, at next Davos. Thank Look you very much. That's Thank great. You. Thanks a lot.